what entertains us? Over the centuries, entertainment has taken many different forms. It's constantly adapting to the current cultural trends of the time. Before I get into the future of technology and entertainment, let's first take a brief look back at its history. In 264 BC, in Roman times, families would travel for miles to witness great spectacles at the Colosseum. Was it to see a play? A symphony, perhaps? No, it was to watch gladiators engage in epic battles. These gladiators would fight each other and sometimes wild animals, often to the death, in the name of entertainment. The audiences loved it, and the rulers at the time actually allowed the audience to choose whether these gladiators would live or die. It was thumbs up or thumbs down. Consider it the one of the earliest forms of crowdsourcing. Fast forward to modern day times, this type of brutal spectacle has now transformed to more casual sporting events like football, soccer, and wrestling. Moving to the 1600s in the Elizabethan era, the spectacles that they had during that time was in the Globe Theater, which is one of the most famous theaters of the world. That theater was an outdoor amphitheater that had seating for over 3,000 guests. Those people would be there in often in stifling heat and sometimes even rain. Now, this theater was very poor compared to what modern day times would be. The set had no scenery. There were very few props. The entertainment was all about the dialogue, the story, the drama, the comedy. Even at that time, the costumes were really important to be able to tell the social status of each of those characters. During those years, Women were not even allowed to perform, and young boys were the ones who would take over the female roles. Now, in current times, we all know that these types of spectacles are in a much more civilized format. They're in a theater much like this, in air conditioning. They've got great set pieces, scenic, amazing lighting, and special effects. In Broadway, those performances can cost up to $75 million to stage. Now, the dialogue is still important as part of that, but it's only a part of the major spectacles that they're performing. Fast forward to the 1920s, and they had a, a new form of entertainment. They had the radio. Families would often gather around the radio in the family room, listening to their daily specials, even though these guys don't look too happy about it. But your family probably looks a little bit more like this. Everybody engaged in their cell phones, texting, tweeting, playing all those apps. The stats are pretty astounding regarding cell phones and application technology. It's completely revolutionized the video game entertainment industry. In 1998, the video game industry was worth $2.6 billion. The mobile gaming industry didn't exist. Fast forward to 2016, video gaming industry ballooned to $30 billion industry. But what about the mobile gaming industry? That surpassed it to $36.9 billion. So that cell phone and that technology is a completely disruptive technological advancement. Let's talk a little bit about theme park industry and how that's changed over the years. SeaWorld in particular has been entertaining and engaging guests for over 50 years. We like to blend up-close animal encounters with world-class thrill rides. We also like to inspire and educate our guests with every trip they come to one of our parks. Signature to that experience has been our orca whales. Last year, in March, SeaWorld announced that we would no longer be breeding orca whales. And instead, we'd be putting on new educational experiences called Orca Encounters, where we highlight the natural abilities of these amazing creatures. Now, it was a very difficult decision to make this switch, but what we realized is as we were looking at the culture and the societal trends, we determined that killer whales in captivity were not gonna be part of it. So we currently live in a time when culture and technology is currently evolving and changing at a more rapid pace than ever. So the themed entertainment industry has to constantly adapt and evolve to stay relevant and interesting to all of our audiences and new generations. 
We have to rewrite the story for new generations. Part of my job is to develop those new stories and new technologies. So I've developed and talked about three different rules, so to speak, of how we can accomplish those tasks. One, we've got to ask ourselves, what is the guest experience? Two, we have to get the ride right. And three, we have to have fun while we're doing it. So let's first tackle guest experience. We have millions of guests coming to our park every year. They come to our parks as an escape from the everyday world. So we ask ourselves, what kind of emotions do we want our guests to achieve while they're coming to our parks? Do we want them to laugh? Do we want them to be scared? Do we want them to be thrilled? Are we gonna take guests face to whiskers with one of our cheetahs? Which, by the way, this is a, a real photo, and this tells you a little bit about how we achieve theme park attraction design. We wanna have these up close encounters with these amazing animals in the foreground, but in the background, we've got these wild thrill attractions. It's got this great layer look to it, but there's a lot of science and engineering and technology to make sure that we can pull that off, not only from a safety perspective for the guests, for our ride, ride engineers, as well as the animals themselves. What else do we wanna provide our guests? Could we provide them their very first experience on a roller coaster? Sure, does anybody remember their first experience on a roller coaster? It's, yeah, it's probably a lot of fun, right? So we can provide those on a daily basis to our guests. When we're looking at what the demographic is, well, the people that are coming to our parks, we have to provide experiences for everyone in the family, whether you're three years old or 93 years old. So one of the most challenging demographics that we're trying to entertain is the millennial generation. So that's about my generation. That generation, they really want to have very immersive, meaningful experiences when they come to their parks. And they also want to prolifically share that experience on social media. So some stats about that. Every minute, there's over 400 hours of video uploaded to YouTube. There's over 161 million daily users of Snapchat. So as I'm developing the theme park attraction, I have to think, how am I gonna provide experiences that guests are going to want to share on their social networks? We also have a stretch goal to provide meaningful experiences for our guests. We would love to have our guests come to our park, be inspired by what they've seen and educated on, take that home, turn that into action, and potentially do something to change the world. One meaningful encounter with one of our dolphins could be the catalyst for someone to devote their life's work to veterinary science. We have a, we have a message at our parks that we like to say about touching the heart to teach the mind. Another question that comes up when we're developing theme parks is, does the technology drive attraction development, or does the attraction drive the technology development? Which is an interesting question. And really the answer to that is yes, both of those is correct. When we're trying to develop a new attraction called Turtle Trek, we wanted to tell the story of a turtle and their life through the turtle's eyes. So to be able to do that, we created a 360 degree 3D dome that we put the guests in, immersed them entire, into that environment. For an upcoming project that I'm working on, uh, Kraken VR, we're putting virtual reality on that roller coaster to be able to take guests to worlds they've never been before. We're taking guests through a time warp to a prehistoric undersea worlds filled with legendary sea creatures. You know, this technology is helping us adapt these types of experiences for new generations. So the second topic that we have is getting the ride right. You know, question is, what, what, is, what does that mean when we're trying to get the ride right? As we're developing our roller coasters, we know that guests want to come there to be thrilled. We don't want them to focus on the restraints of the safety. We want them to focus on the fun. But the key there is that we have got to cohesively tie the creative side and the technology side together to create a one-of-a-kind experience. Now, I'll tell you the one, the one caveat to this rule, as far as safety goes, is has anybody been on Falcon's Fury before? Yeah, a lot of you. So that's our 300 foot tall drop tower. We take guests up 300 feet, then we'll tilt your seat so you're looking straight down at the ground, 
And we know guests are going to be questioning themselves when they're holding on to the restraints. That's the only thing holding them up in the air. So they want to make sure that those engineers, those engineers are the ones who got it right. So as we're developing roller coasters, we, we like to talk about what kind of choreography do we have to achieve this type of experience. And I say choreography because that usually it's reserved for dance, but choreography is also very applicable to the roller coaster designing world. Do we want guests to feel like they're diving down like a Mako shark? So this is our Mako roller coaster at SeaWorld. And do you know why this is a Mako shark? Yeah, so one way that you can tell is that if you look at the very lead car, the gill slits that we have, there's five slits, which is very unique to a Mako shark. Or do we want our guests to run and chase their prey like a cheetah across a Serengeti Plain? So this is our cheetah hunt roller coaster. There's a lot of tools in our toolbox that allow us to create these great experiences on roller coasters. We have LSM -like technology, which allows us to propel guests, launch them, uh, in the case of Cheetah Hunt, up to 60 miles per hour. There's structural systems that allow us to take our guests up in the air 300 feet or more before diving them back down into the ground. There's also very complex software systems that allow us to simulate a ride before we even construct it. So think about all those physics equations you guys have learned in school, right? So lots of that. Really, a roller coaster is just physics in applicable terms. So it's a great way to say, you know, this is what we're going to be developing as what you've learned in school. It's very, very important. Those types of experiences, the development of a roller coaster, is a very interesting process because it takes many months, if not years, to develop the final layout for a roller coaster. We go over 50 different iterations on a ride just to make sure that we get it just right. And the best part about a being a roller coaster designer is the first day that you get to ride the roller coaster because after we've done all the testing, after our test dummies have ridden, then we get to do that for the first time. And we never know if we're going to get the experience just right until that first initial ride. Which leads me to our last rule. We've got to have fun when we're doing our jobs. If we're not having fun, something's wrong. If I'm in a conference room with some of my colleagues and we're working on a, on a new attraction design and nobody's got smiles on their faces, we've got to stop. We've got to say, all right, what, what's going on here? We've got, to change, we've got to change the mold to be able to make sure that this is going to be a great experience for all of our guests. We also want to, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we work for a theme park, right? So we want to make sure that we're going to be taking that experience and that passing that along to our guests. When we're developing a theme park attraction, usually it starts with a concept and a simple napkin sketch. That's where it starts. Being able to see the process from the very beginning and seeing that come to life is one of the best parts about our job. You know, an example here is our cheetah hunt tower. So this is a very iconic tower that we have. We, we started from a very early concept and we got our creative team together with our engineers and said, you know, most structures for a roller coaster, if you think of physics, engineering, structures, it's very big at the bottom and very narrow at the top. But we wanted to flip that around and make it like a tree, very narrow at the, in the bottom and big at the top. So it almost seems like a series of branches coming out the top. And from an engineering perspective, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? That structure should fall over. But after a number of iterations and months and working together but with the, between our creative group and our engineering group, we're able to develop this kind of an iconic element. When we're building a roller coaster or any type of theme attraction, it usually takes about four or more years. So you guys think about those of you who are in high school or getting ready to go to high school, the amount of time it's going to take you to get from being a freshman to a senior and how excited you guys are going to be on graduation day. Because that's the way I feel when I'm getting ready to open one of these new attractions. One last question is, what, what inspires us to develop these themed attractions? In, in my world, I love to travel. I love to go experience new things. And I also love to watch guests come off the rides and see what their reactions are. I love to see everyone smile hoot, holler, clap, having a great time. That inspires me. So I question, what inspires you? I want you to go out and travel as much as possible. I want you to go to new restaurants. I want you to ride the wild rides, go to festivals, eat the crazy foods. All of that type of experience is what I take into my roller coaster and theme park attraction design. And that should be the fuel for your creative designs. 
this generation, your generation, I'm excited to see what you guys will develop in the years to come. Thank you.